Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first pencil with Kathy and Mike. My name is Mike the Car Guy. With me, as always, wicked, wicked awesome car gal, friend to horses everywhere. And since today is Best Friends Day, I'm just going to go ahead and repeat that I've already repeated many times. My best friend, <laughs> Kathy Cruz. Happy Best Friends Day. Happy Best Friends Day. <laughs> It's a great day, but both of us have some some ranting we need to get off our, <laughs> our chest. So buckle in, folks. If you're in automotive, uh, this one might be a little bit of a tough day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Truth hurts. We both have had, uh, as anyone that's listened to our show knows, that combined between the two of us, there's like 90 to 130 years of retail automotive experience <laughs> between us. <laughs> and you would think, you know, that each of us, between the people we know and and the experiences we've had and 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 that we would have smooth and easy transactional processes when working with car dealers and yet in the last couple of weeks both of us have had some challenges uh i will go ahead and take the lead and get it off my chest because it's burning it's burning in me i have a uh i think one thing i can friend. say i just want to say it's um it's not so much truth hurts it's more just tough love because uh, it is. We just want because I love this business, and I don't think we should be here still. And the people I, in I, it, and we love the people in it. We love the people. I in have it. defended this industry for thirty years. I really have. I know why people look at me the way they do when I say I work in the car business, and I always say, "Look, it's it's not not as bad as you've heard, not as bad as your experience. It's it's I'm not that guy. Give me a chance to show you it can be better." And I, I still say that the business has made tremendous strides as a whole. Yes, we are not in the same place we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or, you know, 35 when I first got in it. Believe me, it was much worse back then. But when I have these situations come up, I, I just kind of scratch my head and think, how are we still having this type of specific situation? And it's not necessarily a reflection of the business as a whole, just specific components of it. And there's still folks operating out there in a manner that just doesn't have to be that way. I'm going to go just say, I don't think in some cases it's better than 10 years ago. I think it's worse, honestly, um, especially when it comes to like the way that people are talking to customers, like just the tone and the things I hear. Mm -mm -mm. I don't know. I don't On that, know. I'll agree with you because some of the, 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 the tone and the, the attitudes are like from 35 years ago when I got in the business. And yet these these people that are in the business weren't even born then. You know, mm -hmm. so where did it come from over the last couple of years? How did it reinfuse itself back into the industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So I have a good friend that has a BMW and she leased the BMW three years ago. Uh, it's got 30,000 miles on it. And if you're familiar with the, the market right now, a three-year-old BMW with 30,000 miles on it is like a brick of gold. And she's let me know that multiple dealers have reached out to her, you know, knowing that her lease is coming to term, hoping to buy it, begging to buy it, doing whatever, offering all kinds of things. And she really, 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 truly loves her car. She just does. She takes really good care of it. Um, you know, and you're looking at the market, there's no way you can find that model of BMW, three years old with 30,000 miles on it for anything less than like 54, 59, 60 grand. And so who is this again? Who is this again? You said? She's a very good friend of mine. I call her my sister. She's my wife's best friend. Um, okay. She's not, we're not blood, but she's like a sister to me. I've known her for many years. And when she initially got the lease, I referred her to a dealer that I knew somebody was working at. And she had a great experience because she leased it there. She felt, which is what we plan on, right? We try to really, really earn that obligation from a dealership standpoint. She felt like, okay, I got to go back to the original dealer. She didn't want to call anybody else she didn't want to you know look at her other options she said well i leased it here i'll go back to them she set the appointment she was very clear for uh, a pre-inspection a while back i'm not going to buy another car i'm not going to lease another car i'm not going to look at another car no you can't have my car from me i love it i'm keeping it i'm i'm very familiar with it i know how it's been serviced i know it's been taken care of i know the opportunity I have to purchase this vehicle, it's its a pretty good value to me. They gave her the impression, like, not a problem. We'll make it quick and easy for you when you get ready to come back in. That was the, the pre-inspection. She came back. Um, so she set the appointment and she called me 
and said, look, will you go with me? I just, I've been dealing with two or three different guys. I'm now that we're getting closer to it. When I get the calls, I just, I just don't get a good vibe. Um, there's a lot of pressure going on and can you just go with me? Not a problem. I'll go with you. So she picks me up and on the way over there, she says, look, you got to promise me not to make a scene. And I went, what do you mean make a scene? She goes, look, I'm just, and she's real, not, you know, she's kind of a timid person, you know, and she's like, like, I just don't want, I know that you can pick these guys apart and tell them what they're doing wrong, but just, I just need you with me to, to be someone, you know, just my, my confidence. I go, not a problem. I'm not going to say a word. So we get there, the salesperson uh, meets her at the door, walks her to the desk and launches into, um, you know, opportunities on a new BMW. And he won't let her get a word in edgewise. He just talks, 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 talking about the same payment, no money down, blah, 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 blah. We got a white one and a black one. I'm going to go get the keys and pull up the white one so you can look at it. And she's trying to, to get a word in edgewise. And he starts to walk away and she's like, look. Gabriel, I, I appreciate it. And she's trying to be polite. She goes, I appreciate it. I don't want to look at another car. I told you that a month ago. I told you that when I called and made this appointment. So I, I know you're trying to do a job, but I don't want to look at a car. He goes, just take a look at it. And I'm like sitting there like, okay, I get it. On, on the one hand, I kind of get it. And I can appreciate your your you know passion to to try and sell a new car. But you know, like the second or third time she's real adamant, you, you just kind of got to go with it at some point. Mm -hmm. He goes, I just wanted you to take a look at it. So he leaves. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there for a good 10 minutes and he comes back in and he goes, you know what? Uh, it, I think it's on our, our holding lot. Um, so I'm going to have to go get it. And she's like, oh, no. Look, you don't have to. Oh. You don't have to. You didn't have to go walking around the lot for 10 minutes, pressing the button, looking for it. And And she said, without any coaching, she goes, if it was that important to you, why didn't you find it have like it this morning That's right. and have it pulled up, you know, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. I just want to buy my car. Mm -hmm. So she goes, I know we've talked about, it. I know how much it is. I have 9,000 in cash and the rest in a, in a, a, a certified check. So he gets all like, all right. Okay. So he starts doing the paperwork, has her do a credit app and he goes, um, you know, I need to do this for BMW financial because we have to finance you just in case your check bounces. And he was just real. Oh my I God. understand oh my God. the backing behind it, but he was, you know, his, his attitude went 180 degrees right now. He's kind of being rude and being short, goes into the sales office, spends at least 10 minutes in the sales office. And I know I like to exaggerate sometimes and make a point, but I, well, I'm not here because we were there for three hours and 13 minutes and 11 of those minutes were in finance. So it was three hours sitting in the showroom oh my for God. nothing. Oh my God. But so comes back out of the sales office. He goes, oh, you know what? We're going to have to finance you and you can just pay it off with the bank because we don't do one pays anymore. What? And that's when I looked at him and I, excuse me? He goes, yeah, we don't, we don't take one pays for at least payoffs anymore. You have to finance with BMW. And then you can pay it off with them, preferably after mm -hmm. like three months. <gasps> and I'm like, I looked at him. I said, Gabriel, um, it's 2023. Are you actually saying this right now? Yeah. Right. Have you any idea what you're actually implying? And he goes, well, it's, it's policy. I mean, and at that point, once I started to speak up, <laughs> then, then my friend, she kind of kind of like withdrew a little bit. She's like, okay, just, I just want this to be done. We'll just, we'll, whatever I can do it. She, she looks at me and she goes, I can do that. I can pay it. I go, yeah, you can pay it off. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, it's an extra step, but yeah, we can get it all wrapped up. Um, the, the benefit of doing it through the dealership, obviously you don't have to go to the DMV and transfer the title and everything else. Um, so there's some pluses to, to just doing this and wrapping it up. So she goes, if that's the way it's gotta be, that's the way it's gotta be. If I pay it off before my first payment, I probably won't have you know, but sense and interest of any, probably no interest at that point. There's no prepayment penalties, right? He goes, I don't know for sure, but I don't think so. I go, there's none. <laughs> so we go, okay. So then he starts to work out a, a car deal, showing her what her payments are going to be, asking her what terms. She's like, I don't, I don't care. Just pick a term. I'm not going to plan on making payments. And then he starts to, to go about, you know, warranties, right? And she goes, you know, wow. I, I'm really really confident in my car i appreciate he goes you know you're taking a big risk and driving this car without any kind of warranty on it 
And I get that. I get, I get that. You know, I really do. I spent 30 years in the car business, I, but sometimes it's not as much what you say as how you say. He became really condescending. She goes, so what you're telling me is I'm driving a three-year-old BMW with 30,000 miles on it. It's going to break tomorrow. You don't have any confidence in the product you're selling. Yeah. You guys sell BMWs that cost a hundred thousand dollars. Are you telling customers that they're all crap? Should I doubt my, my investment? He's like, well, I'm just saying it's a big risk. German cars are very expensive to repair. And I'm like, <laughs> and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Right. So I go, can we just get her into finance and just, and just get this done? And he let goes, me get well, this Is this a salesperson or is this a lease return? Okay. Oh, it was an internet salesperson. They didn't have a dedicated lease. Internet sales program. Right. right. Which, again, you and I, I mean, we probably think really similar about this. I put myself in the driver's seat. If I'm the desk guy, I'm the GSM in that store, and it's obvious the person just wants to buy it out. At that point, okay, just quick and it. easy. We, yeah, make it as easy as possible for the yeah. customer so that they're there a minimum amount of time. Mm -hmm. here's your contract sign right here 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 yep. i could have done it on the, the okay. desk in the showroom i wouldn't have had to pull them into the office i mean i would have had my finance person come out do a quick meet and greet find out what opportunities are there if there's no opportunity for upsell on any other back-end product there's no reason to go dragging them into here here's some paperwork sign 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 copy copy done have a nice day great folks thank you for stopping in because in my mind a person that's walking into a bmw store with 30,000 in their pocket to pay off the lease isn't they're not hanging out with people that can't afford to buy a BMWs they're in a circle of people that like that car that appreciate that car so that experience is going to resonate out to the world I'm going to get some type of business some type of repeat referral well you're going to get review. service business you're going to get oh, service please. business there's 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 all kinds of value in that customer beyond am I going to make a couple bucks right this second and okay, so I have to interrupt because uh, first of all, two things. One, it used to be, I, maybe it's changed, but um, it was that uh, all BMW stores had to have a, a dedicated lease return person so as to treat them the way you're talking about. Because BMW looks at the customer like that as their customer. They're the, the BMW financial services customer rather than the dealer customer. It's how they look at it. And so they want you to have that dedicated person to be, to act the right way. Um, I, yeah. And also then the second thing is uh, I don't know how legal it is to require someone to finance something when they have the cash. That seems very odd to me. Uh, I don't know why you would force them to do that because uh, that's that I, maybe, maybe so. I could understand I if know. it was a personal check just to give the dealership that safety net. Yeah, but they have a contract they can collect on it. That's, I, there's, that's not a simple arguing, lease yeah. return. It's a simple lease <laughs> return. I'm just thinking not a return, but at least buyout. Sorry, I get wanting to protect the dealer and have a cashable contract if it doesn't go through. At that yeah. point, make it like an option contract, right? Exactly. But, That's all you do. Yeah, I don't know why it. No, they were adamant. We are not. We are, and and it was told in three different ways from the salesperson to the GSM, and then finally the finance manager. So I got three different versions of we don't do that anymore. It's our policy. We can't. We're not allowed to. And then the other one was, it's just the dealership's way of doing things. So it would they be weren't even in agreement on it. It would be interesting for her to call BMW Financial and ask about that and see. She plans on it. Good. We because... both made a couple of days of cool off. And dude, I would definitely like to hear what the result would be. Because I have It'll a, a follow-up. It is the... Uh, the, uh, the the dealership owners, who, the company that owns its policy per se, which doesn't make it, I mean, yeah, the employees need to do what the policy is, but if the customer says no, thank you, and you still tell them too bad, that's, that's, I don't, anyway, okay, so continue, sorry. We, in any other situation, I would have stood up and exited the dealership and gone to other agencies. I know, I, I know someone at BMW of Murrieta that specializes he's a lease renewal lease buyout lease mm -hmm. termination person he would have prepared her documentation and brought it to her or had had a you know someone right. bring it up to her without knowing that the inspection had already been done he you know 
there's there's dealerships that go out of their way to provide great customer service. Yeah. Um, it, this one just really was bad, and you she just wanted it. You never go wrong it. doing that. You never no. go wrong being kind and helpful and there to help them. You never go wrong. The person with respect, right? That's yeah. yeah. What a concept. I mean, so three hours. The sales office is right there. I know that there's no one, there's no other deals going on. I'm I'm watching and I know what a deal is. There's no one on the showroom. There's nothing going on. They start negotiating a deal two two boots over. The GSM comes out and, and he's just hard, hard sell negotiating with this guy. I literally told the guy, look, I've got 74 of these in transit. All of them but one are spoken for. I don't need to sell you this car. Mm-hmm unless you step up to the plate using terminology that I just wouldn't use in 2023. Mm -hmm. So he got finished working his deal. That guy leaves, he walks by, I go, excuse me. Uh, and he turns and he goes, yeah. I go, it's, it's been three hours and she just needs to sign. He goes, are you on the contract? <gasps> no. And I'm not trying to speak for her because I know that oh, because I'm not personally involved and there's privacy things involved. I get that. But I'm just wondering, he goes, I can't say anything to you, ma'am. We'll get you oh. back in just a few moments. I go, wow, that's a really, that's a really great attitude. I go, you realize everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. He goes, who are you? I go, it doesn't matter. Who are you? But, no what way. Matters, he goes, I go, what matters is that she's a customer. Okay. She shouldn't have to have a friend come in with her so that this process doesn't go south. Because even though I'm with her this process has turned to junk. Who knows what it would have been like if she'd been by herself. Oh God, okay? no, she'd have been there. She'd still be there. This is this is really a, a negative experience. But on the flip side, I got to commend you because apparently you have so much business and, and I just couldn't control my, I go, you could give a fuck about customers walking in that aren't buying anything right now. That yeah. must be awesome for you. Yeah. You guys got to be killing it. Although I've been here for three hours now I haven't seen anything but that deal you just blew out the door a few minutes ago so I don't know where the other business is maybe on Saturdays you, you roll a bunch of cars but I haven't seen nothing go today but the way you're acting you guys are number one in the nation I think so that's good for you he goes yeah you're a big tough guy aren't you so he walks away I'm like and she's grabbing my arm she's like look I don't I don't want to scene. I just want to go I go I'm sorry that won't happen again we get into contracts Oh, no, no, no. We go through all the, the paper, the printed laser forms. And she goes, I'm going to send you a link to your phone for the contract. Uh, I could do it on the iPad, um, but it I didn't put it on the charger last night, so it's dead. I could go get one of the iPads from the showroom floor, but it's just easier on your phone. It's just really small. And I looked at her and I said, do you, do you hear yourself? Wow. I could go get an iPad, but I don't feel like it. I guess she's just buying out her lease. So there's no real benefit to you. She's already told you she's not going to buy warranty, tire protection, anything like that. But she doesn't become subhuman because of that. She's no. still a person and deserves a certain level of, of respect and dignity. You could go get an iPad. You just choose not to. So she, you sent the link to her phone. And if you've ever looked at a contract on a phone, on a DocuSign. Yeah, that's it's, not good. <laughs> it's fucking that big, you know? Yeah. And she's trying to, she's like, she goes, and she, she even said I, i'm not trying to read every line of this contract i'd just like to know what i'm signing that's all and she goes i already told you what you're signing you're signing a financial contract being a financial what and no i'm not exaggerating i wish i was exaggerating i wish it was like one of those you know oh that didn't happen i i wish it was just something i was making up just for a conversation i i swear to you i wish that was the case it was one of the most challenging experiences I've ever had with the dealership from a customer standpoint in 35 years of being at dealerships. And on the other side, I have never had an experience like that as a dealer. I know for a fact, I've never made buying a car as horrible an experience for a customer as they did for my friend. Never, not once, no. not even close. No. And uh, to me, that's a direct reflection of management and the lack of leadership, uh, a direct reflection, uh, and and honestly, not very, not very decent thinking about it all. Because a person that buys their their lease 
needs to come for service. And it's in the time frame where there's more service that's going to be required on the vehicle. And why wouldn't you treat that person like gold? Because that's where the money's going to come from. And she lives in the area. Like there wasn't, it wasn't like she didn't live in the area and they didn't care. Oh, well, let's blow her out. Let's do it whatever we want because she's not going to ever come back. There are those people that act that way. No, they didn't even, I don't think even entered into their mind that, that she might come back for service. It can't because that's just not the way they act. It's not in their programming. You can tell by every, everything that went on in that whole transaction, that's just not part of who they are. They don't, they just don't care. It's such a shame. There's a lot more, but for, for time consideration, I just wanted to share kind of the highlights of it and say that guys, it doesn't have to be this tough. You know, I have a, a friend I, I met a, 20 years ago and he was a manager with Starbucks and, and in his shop, he used to keep a note right next to the, the, the old school cash register point of sale system that they had at the time. It said, make it as easy as possible to be our customer. Yeah. And that always resonated with me. I loved that because it's real simple. Yeah. Just yeah. make it easy. Whether I'm looking at a dealership's website, if it's too complicated, I think from a customer standpoint, they're not going to click the 17 different boxes to get the information that they need. Let's make it easy. Buying a lease out shouldn't require all these, you know, whatever it is, getting a test drive in a car should be real easy. Mm -hmm. It should be a streamlined, smooth process. And when we talk about modern customers, I don't think it means anything more than that. Just make it easier than it has been. Right. Yeah. We used to have signs throughout the store at Beverly Hills BMW uh, that was a take on the, uh, if you remember the Ritz Carlton University, I don't think they have it anymore, but you could actually go there. Customer relations uh, managers could go. Uh, that for worked for all kinds of companies. It wasn't just automotive specific, but BMW had, I remember had a, uh, like a, 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 some kind of a meeting where uh, they presented this idea. And, uh, and so we, we went with it and we used to have signs all over the store that was, it said, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. And it, nice. It, a simple sign throughout the store on all the doors and people see it every day and it it just sets the tone so that you know you're you're a ladies and gentlemen and you're serving a ladies and gentlemen and just remember you create a culture around that yeah and we did and we we did pretty fucking good at it but unfortunately uh that is not the case in this in this uh illustration here that you you said, um, I have you've a, also had a challenge. So yes, share I, your I, challenge. I have a challenge. It's not quite that, that dramatic, but, um, uh, the, the horse rescue needs a truck. Uh, we have, uh, we have to tow obviously a uh, horse trailer, things like that. Uh, it's also summertime and, uh, it's uh, fire season also. And we have a current truck, but that truck is, um, I think it's 20 years old. <laughs> uh, and we have two trucks, actually. One is uh, the founder's vehicle, but uh, the other is our regular truck. But we, anyway, we need something new. And it's the exact wrong time to purchase something, but we're just, uh, it's getting so we're spending too much money on the vehicle, the vehicle we have now to fix it. So um so but i don't know if anyone's had to buy uh, a truck a domestic truck chevy ford dodge ram um this whole world of trucks is new to me because i'm i'm not a truck person and uh I, I can't believe how much people pay for these trucks and i can't believe how tricked out they are i mean i can believe because i know you know people want that i get it but uh we certainly don't need all that but nonetheless um there are huge uh, issues still with these particular trucks. It's uh, an F-250 or something similar, uh, crew cab, four by four. So it's got to have a tow, towing ability and stuff. So uh, that apparently when they get them in, they sell them right away. So there's no incentives typically. There's no reduced rate. There's nothing. We looked at used and used are just as much and the rates are just as much. And so we might as well buy new. Uh, but uh, so in this particular case, uh, I was dealing with someone that um, uh, that I knew through someone else and 
uh, I don't, that's how I do a deal for someone. I ask people who they know. If I don't know somebody, then I'll ask somebody else. And if there's flat out nobody I know that knows, I'll just cold call and get like the GM or something on the on the phone. So, but nonetheless, I talked to this guy and um, in the beginning it was great. And he said, okay, well, we need a thousand down and uh, I've got three. And I'm like, great. Uh, he never mentioned that, he didn't say the last part. I've got three coming in. He Inbound. didn't say that part. <laughs> uh, and I didn't think to ask because again, I'm not only am I from Highline, but I'm also from import. I'm, I'm, I mean, the last time I worked at a, like a domestic store was probably 1991. So <laughs> it's not, it's not something I remember. So, um, uh, but, but he had told me this, these nightmares of what they're, they're, they're getting from uh, just waiting for the vehicle to come in and uh, the, the, the delivery dates are being pushed back and they're having trouble. It's, it's a, it's a big deal, but I just didn't realize it was that big a deal. So, so we give him the thousand down and I'm like, okay, so, you know, when are we going to come pick it up? And, and he said, well, let me see, um, you know, let me see. And then it was a texting situation and there was just something evasive about it. I didn't, I got just, you know, the, the bullshit detector comes up. And so long story short, it really was not per se, not really his fault. It really is the delivery issue with the factory not being able to like get their cars on the ground for God's sakes. I don't know. It's bad, but, um, and I'm, I wasn't looked to blame. I just thought it was coming. I thought it was here. They were looking for some clarity. It may not have been his fault, but he wasn't yeah. forthcoming either. He that's, wasn't being straight. Yes. And that's my point. So when you are talking to a customer I'm a person that likes it. Just give me all the detail. Give me, give me the, the truth. I don't care how bad it is. We can, whatever it is, we can get past it and we'll be fine. And I prefer directness. I'm a direct person. Uh, I'm not rude. I just am direct about what I want. And I'm pretty clear about saying that up front. And unfortunately, uh, there was just a, I, I guess you could call it miscommunication, but, you know, I think my advice in, in this case is that if, if you just tell the person the truth, uh, even though you don't know that it, the delivery date, you can say, I think the delivery is going to be this date, but don't hold me on it because of what I mentioned about this, this, this supply chain situation. If you tell me that I'm all good. I'm all good. But I had a board to talk to, to tell, and I couldn't go to them. They're like, well, can we come pick it up? And I said, I don't know. Let me find out. And I just couldn't find out. I couldn't find for the life of me. I couldn't get a date. Because and the truck wasn't there and it's still it not there. there. And it's still not there as we speak. And it's been uh, a couple weeks. Uh, and, and none of that, all, all of that is overcomable. Uh, it does get into a, a squeeze because uh, we, it's the fire season situation, um, you know, so there's that, <laughs> but um, anyway, so I, at this point, we don't have the truck. I got kind of, it was, it, what ends up happening, you know, not to me, I don't, I'm not this way, but I think a customer would infer that, okay, you're not being truthful with me now. What else are you not going to be truthful with? And when you're just direct and you just come out and say it, it's all good. It's all good. They're not going to think poorly of you. They might get mad. Yes. But, uh, you know, it's better than, you know, it's better having them a little bit mad, but then still being able to sell them the vehicle rather than, rather than portraying yourself as something, someone not to be trusted. And then you might say something that- Prolong, avoid, and delay it. Yeah, all of that is just that avoidance of conflict. It's right. it's in, it's a typical thing in sales about avoidance of conflict, uh, but- I, That's what I was gonna say. As a, as a manager, I've, I've recognized that for my whole entire career. People will do anything they can to avoid that conflict. And most of the time, the conflict's not real. It's, it's, it's right. imagined. Yeah. We do it to ourselves, whether it's a service advisor talking to a customer saying, I may be able to get it out by five o'clock today, but in his head, he knows it's a three-day job, Yeah. but it, he thinks it's easier to tell the guy five o'clock and then yeah. he'll deal with it later at yeah. five o'clock. But meanwhile, that customer's counting on getting his vehicle at five o'clock. And when you say, oh, you know, it's going to be till Thursday. Yeah. Now you got now you got a, a bigger, bigger problem. Situation. Yeah. He would have been pissed if you'd have told him, I can't get it out for two days. He, 
oh, fuck, okay, yeah, let's get it done. That would have been much easier to deal with than telling a guy that he's expecting to get his car at five o'clock, he's not going to get it for two days. Same yeah. thing up front in sales. We we spend this mental energy trying to avoid a conflict that probably wouldn't have been there because you're not unique. I mean, you are unique, believe me. You're completely unique and amazing and wonderful, <laughs> but you're not unique in the fact that you don't want that game. Most people don't. They just want yeah. the straight information. Yeah. Yeah, right? Just talk to me straight. I, if, it, no. if that's the price of the car, that's the price of the car. But as soon as you start to waver, now I'm going to sense that and we're going to sit and go. No, it is what it is. It's not going to be better doing that. It's not going to be better. It makes it worse. And I have, I felt also, you know, as a female, just in general, uh, you know, dealing with car dealers, it's, it's very dicey. And uh, all of the old stereotypes are still there. Uh, and, uh, so that enters into when I'm dealing with these people. Um, and, and also, you know, it was a referral. And so now that person that referred me is going to probably feel bad, even though they shouldn't. Um, but it, it's just all just, just tell the truth. And like, I feel like I wasn't being heard too, because I said, listen, I have to, it's not just me. I have to communicate to my board about what we're doing. And, uh, it was, uh, the what they believe and what I believed is that you had the vehicle on the ground and you know he never even said no we'd never had it on the ground he never even <laughs> corrected me so I just had to piece it all together myself by what I know but a regular customer isn't going to know that so anyway I just I don't want to go too I far especially off, liked but... when he said look I'm I'm on a day off I just came off a 12 oh, day yeah. run I'm mm -hmm. with my family like trying to get some empathy from you like you know cut me a break i went 12 days straight bell to bell it's my only day out dude this all could have been avoided with mm -hmm. some honesty mm -hmm. two weeks ago so i wouldn't be, I wouldn't be like, talking to you if yeah, that was the come case. at me like this. i did something wrong by trying to find out about this car that you promised yeah. me <laughs> yeah at, at the end of the day as we i take it and i extrapolate it out into the future uh well first of all i went to another dealer to see what's up because that obliterated did you get a hold of that Ford dealer i did yep and i'm talking to their fleet commercial fleet guy awesome. uh the the dealer was very friendly very nice he called me right back he got he had actually had a guy call me first and then he followed up which was awesome um they don't have any on the ground either which is great but he's he's like he he called me back the fleet guy and uh let me think i think i talked to him on a saturday and then the following monday so monday this week he called me and said hey just want to touch base haven't found anything yet i'm working on it it's really hard i'll get back to you i'm like awesome thank you that's all i need you know i just and it's not that i don't i don't know i just uh as time goes on i as a salesperson or whoever wherever you are in, in the dealership hierarchy, don't you want to get referred by people? <laughs> don't you? They're usually easier to close. They usually come in and go, where do I sign? Uh, it, referrals are way better. And I'm not going to refer that guy. I just, when you start putting your guilt trip on me because you're with your kids, it's like, hey, motherfucker, I got stuff to do too, okay? Uh, I, I, I'm, I wouldn't have to talk to you had you been up front. That's all. That's the point. So- just tell the customer the truth. And uh, I know we're always fighting against the stereotype, Mike and I. Um, I don't, I, I think it's a losing battle, honestly, but we don't give up anyway uh, because we have been in environments where we treated people that the way we want to be treated, um, like Beverly Hills BMW, as I mentioned all the time, you know, we were very, we were number one in sales, number one in service, number one in parts, number one in CSI. And we had, you know, very little turnover. We had, people that uh, really enjoyed their job. And pr we did, pr we promoted people. We were part of a larger group, a larger auto group. And um, in Beverly Hills of all places where there's like no place to park and- <laughs> And you were making room. money. You know, there's, there's, yeah, and no, made lots of money. there's no conflict between profit and success. You, right. know, you don't have to become a volume store by giving things away. That's, there's no, profit is not a four letter word. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with making a profit. And when you do things the right way, you tend to make more. Yeah, you do. And we were pro we proved it. But again, that's probably 
I mean, I'm not going to say a unicorn, but uh, I will say it's very rare. And uh, over the past, I'd say 10, 15 years, I I used to think it was more common, but it, I don't anymore. <laughs> but I think both of us share that that belief that the industry can be better than we've allowed it to be. Mm -hmm. There are still a lot of good people in this business. You know, my relate my experience at this BMW store in Riverside doesn't reflect my outlook on the entire industry. I mean, I'm still knee deep in it. I'm not going anywhere. I love this business. I love car people. I surround myself with car people. I just find it unfortunate that I keep hearing about these things. You know, a couple of weeks ago, it was a, a friend of my wife's that called her. And she said, you know, is, is Mike there? And she put her on speaker. They were at a Nissan store having, you know, the same kind of difficulties. The guy that was going to appraise their car suddenly disappeared. They couldn't find him. So they couldn't get their keys back. And they're like, what? and I'm like, what? How, how are we losing customers keys in 2023 yeah, still, yeah. you know? Yeah. But it happens. It happens enough that I recognize that we still have a long way to go. It reminds so we talk me about that... these big ideas about digital retail and you know these tools that will increase efficiency for stores and all these things. And at the bottom line, man, at the end of the day, we're still sometimes treating customers like shit. So it really doesn't matter how good your system is. You know, this new shiny CRM or a service laden tool with texting your customer. If you're treating people like shit, it doesn't matter. Dehorsing a customer, literally. Uh, I just remembered, I I think that they should, uh, uh, when you take the vehicle away or the keys away, that is, um, wasn't that in the movie Used Cars? Didn't they do that? I think they did. We've all done that. That are the, the suckers, that the one that was called suckers. There was another one called suckers. And then, but anyway, that like, that's from like a shitty, you know, used car lot in the seventies that, that, that have we not gotten any better i don't know i it's embarrassing honestly but but there's still a lot of good out there let's talk about something fun what are you listening to what do you got to share with us what did you watch you're big in the in the documentaries are you listening to the music or watching documentaries this week uh i have a couple of things to uh to share, share. uh i just watched i think it's on hulu uh, it's called The Secrets of Hillsong, this Hillsong Church. Oh, my. Now, I had already watched a documentary on this church. It was um, not, not good, not good. They had this pastor guy, the guy that originally started it, then his son, and then uh, it grew into something pretty big. It was out of Australia. And... Um, uh, yeah, so uh, the uh, pastor in New York was this, like dude bro that like Justin Bieber was his friend and it was all over the it was they were very out there this few years ago and um so he uh they could someone caught him uh having an extramarital affair so it was a what they call fall from grace but then things got worse and uh it's pretty bad and it's a documentary series and I'm like I say I think it's it's on Hulu yeah it's called the secrets of Hillsong so uh uh really uh fascinating and interesting very applicable to our current situation uh and uh, so there's that um uh again uh it's it's was Vanderpump Rules uh third uh, episode of the reunion this week last night we're recording there was three episodes of the reunion there's three yeah third one was last <laughs> night it was the final and uh did not disappoint in any stretch and uh i also watched watch what happens live with andy cohen after it and lala was on uh and uh fascinating and um uh yeah i it's just appalling what's happened but um i'm glad for Ariana. <laughs> And then on the music scene, uh, we just a quick thing that um, two two things we you and I you sent me a a video it was a short video of Elvis Costello on SNL when he was first on there and when he got banned when he got banned yep I yep. loved that you and I you had shared that story and I, and I'll share again with everyone out there you and I over the the years have shared many interests with each other and and found a common bond in a lot of things and some time back you had you had shared Elvis Costello and I was very honest saying you know I just never got into Elvis Costello I, I always felt like he was one of those people that was kind of like pushed on people like this is the guy you are supposed to think is cool if you're a fan of 
new wave type music, you need to revere Elvis Costello. And it was so much that I kind of resisted it. And, and through our conversations, I've kind of gained a respect for him. And when I didn't realize he had been banned off in SNL, you were the one that shared that with me the first time when you told me the story, but I was like, all right, he's kind of a rebel. I get it. All right. I, I dig rebels. And that's when I started opening my mind. And, and over the last couple of years, I've really become a fan, not like huge, but I enjoy his music a lot differently than I did before. And when I saw that video, I was, when I saw it on there, I just, I just loved it. I knew you would, you would dig it. So I had to share it with you. Yeah, he got, uh, he was the, the, the it boy and, uh, he went on there and the record company wanted him to sing the song called Less Than Zero. And it was about this, this fascist dude from England that no one in America knows about. His name was Oswald Mosley. Not that that matters, but, uh, and Less Than Zero was about that. And, um, so the record company made him sing that, but about, I want to say maybe 30 seconds in, he just stopped. Not even that, like 10 seconds, a couple chords, and then he stopped, yeah. stop, 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 stop. stop. Yeah. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen, this, this song isn't, isn't uh, appropriate here or something like that. And then they, then he counts everybody in to sing Radio Radio, which was, it was so awesome, very applicable to here. So, uh, and ended up being, I think, like one of the like really most popular songs he ever sent. So, uh, so when they did that, they were obviously pissed off because it's a live show and all of that. So they banned him, uh, but then they welcomed him back in. Uh, I want to say that was when was that? Like 80, 81, 80, 82, so I don't know, eighty, maybe nineteen eighty. And so uh, a few years later, I think around ninety one ish. Uh, the Beastie Boys were on SNL and um, they came out singing. What did they come out singing? Was it Sabotage? I think I watched too many in a row and I forget. But anyway, they come out singing and then in the middle of it, they go, no, 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 that song. We don't want to do that song. We're going to do this song. And then Al Elvis Costello comes out and they start singing Radio Radio. And it's awesome because it's the Beastie Boys singing Radio Radio. It's like, could it, it's all better than Elvis Costello singing Radio Radio because, you know, they're just awesome. So much awesomeness on one oh stage. Oh my God, they're so awesome. So there's a friggin' documentary you should watch is that um, it's it's Adam, um, when Adam Yelp passed, um, the two that were left uh, were- our, Mike Yep, yeah, and um, yeah, and- they 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 did a Broadway, it was a Broadway show or Broadway, it looked like Broadway. I don't think it was Broadway per se, but it was definitely like in a live audience and they filmed it and it was just a, a walking through their whole history. And um, it's really interesting and really cool and to hear the whole story about how they made it and what, just to hear it from the both of them, it's really great. And you can also kind of see the sadness that they don't have their best friend with them um but it's great so that's i can recommend it okay so my, my final thing <laughs> somehow i have a lot this week um Good. somebody said uh somebody shared something that uh who was it it was somebody this morning and they said uh foo fighters uh oh it was bill playford on facebook actually bill playford said uh he was glad to see uh dave Grohl singing something without screaming or something and so i commented i said uh one man screaming is another woman's sexy growl or something like that. Or sexy <laughs> <roar>. <laughs> and because uh, I don't mind his screaming, but anyway, um, so they're coming to Dana Point, which those that don't live in in Southern California, Dana Point's a sleepy little beach town, kind of. It's it's gotten a little uh, gentrified, but uh, well, I should say a lot gentrified, but known for its exclusive harbor. Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, but it really Maybe mega million dollar yachts are more yeah. there. Yeah. So I guess there's some festival or something going on in, this, oh, wow. in in September. So I go on to look at the tickets. How much do you think they are? Just take a guess. They gotta be seven fifty, five hundred, seven fifty. Eight twenty five. Eight twenty five to see food fighters. <laughs> and I just I find that just ridiculous i'm just so glad i was able to see them before all this nonsense right. started and well contextually it, it it's ridiculous but completely in line for dana point dana point oh, yes. is well for is anything a, a hoity-toity like i said the 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 harbor that's there at one point um when i had friends that that had boats um had like a 10-year waiting list 
the only way to get in was when someone yeah, sure. you know passed mm-hmm. away. Yeah. You yeah. don't say, oh, I got a new boat. Um, can I dock it at Dana Point? No. 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 All right there. Uh, Newport too. It's an exclusive. I mean, the the yachts there are beyond words. You know, you don't see any rinky dink little you know eighteen foot beater sailboats parked in there, <laughs> and unless they're millionaires that have moored there for you know 50 years or something i mean it's just a really exclusive really sheltered really orange county place so 825 completely makes sense it sucks but it makes sense for them it's yeah so there's my i'm just glad i got to see them before all the nonsense started with uh ticket prices and ticket master and ticket master is the worst yeah i saw something yesterday on on twitter that i wanted to bring up uh, Mike Ness, lead singer of Social Distortion, yeah. mm-hmm. very famous um, SoCal, mm-hmm. kind of a post-punk because they came out, they hit really hard as punk had already kind of faded. Um, I was lucky enough to see Social at so many local bars in LA. Um, Al's Bar was my favorite venue for, that was my stomping grounds for many years. And the area that Al's Bar originally was is now like a really refurbished artists district there's like a lot of lofts in that area and what used to be al's bar is now this high-end clothing store where you know they they sell pants that are like 250 dollars for the bought you know a thousand dollars for just a pair of slacks you know that kind of a store yeah. um and it's funny to go in there and say this was once Al, al's bar I, i've seen people throw up in that corner right there but now you're selling pants for a thousand dollars a pair where was it where is it al's bar is yeah. in the loft district like where, where there's actually a documentary about al's bar i'll send you the link if i can find it uh like what streets i, I can't remember the name i know how to get there i can't remember the name oh, of the okay. street all right all right i saw social distortion perform there probably a dozen times you know back in the day they used to send out pieces of paper and they would yeah. fold them up and they would put a a little like a little thing it's called a stamp and they would put it on there yeah. and they would mail it to you <laughs> yes. with concert dates yeah. <laughs> i was on their mailing list and and i mean not not it's not even a brag it's just it was i saw them enough that i would get that little head nod from mike ness when he'd see me yeah. and my friend mark there he'd be like hey guys what's up That's that right. that was always kind of cool but the reason i'm saying that is um mike ness was recently diagnosed with uh throat cancer i heard that and uh, he actually knew about it all the way. He was finishing up an album and he continued singing and he wanted to get the album finished before he said anything and, and went into treatment and all this stuff. So he's he's dealing with that. So I want to just send out a big shout out to Mike Ness. He's, he's a hardcore dude. So I'm sure cancer ain't going to get him. He's going to kick its ass and then be out there again, rocking hard. So... Yeah. Sending lots of love out to to Mike Ness. Hope he gets through this thing. Yeah, yeah. Cancer sucks. Cancer sucks. Not to end on a on a, a a bad note because there really is no bad. I mean, social distortion is still alive and, and making some kick ass music. Mm-hmm. Big fan. Uh, thank you all for paying attention and listening in. Hopefully, you smiled, you learned something, or you thought about something. And if you had a thought based off of anything we talked about, we want to hear about it. We want to get you involved, maybe have you on the show, share it. Or if you want some feedback on something that you're dealing with at the dealership where you're at and want to know how it could be better, what you could do, you got a lot of experience right here that between the two of us, we'd love to help you get better at what you're doing and share with you and then talk about it here on the show. Like, you know, Joe at this dealer was dealing with this and we all put our heads together and now he's doing this and it's awesome. So somebody else could benefit from that as well. Yeah, for sure. So that's all I've got. How about right. you, Kathy? Yeah, that's all I got too. So we'll uh we'll see y'all next week. Bye for now. Thank you for a great day. <laughs>